Hey friends, this is Bernard from Jurassic Time with another installment in our continuing studies into all things Jurassic Park. I was privileged enough to speak at length with none other than the paleontologist Jack Horner. Dr. Horner is known for his studies on the Tyrannosaurus Rex, his work on the Chickensaurus Project, as well as his involvement as the paleontological advisor to the first five Jurassic Park films. He was kind enough to share with us his recollections from the films and his career. In the first film, there's been a lot of discussion over the sick triceratops scene. We have some of the earlier scripts and due to accidental ingestion of berries and their antimicrobial properties, the triceratops was said to actually be getting infections and tooth decay causing its ailment. In the final script, what we, in what we know they filmed, it's explained that the Triceratops was swallowing gizzard stones, but we know that due to the heavily evolved teeth and lack of gizzard stones in any of the fossil finds, Triceratops didn't actually do that. Was that ever a discussion you recall being involved in or adding input towards? Well, no, I, I would, you know, my, big, my biggest complaint about the Triceratops was that there weren't any dinosaurs eating it. <laughs> the, dinosaurs, the dinosaurs were were breaking into buildings and cars and everything else to get a, yeah. eat a person that nobody was out there eating that triceratops <laughs> <laughs> that's funny you're right though that the carnivores seemed a little bit more preoccupied with the people than a buffet that was in front of them <laughs> What's funny though, is that ILM actually made a display of the Stan Winston studio maquettes and they actually put raptors on the sick triceratops. Was that something you told them they should do? <laughs> well, I kept telling somebody they needed to eat that triceratops. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of food there, I'm sure. <laughs> That's funny. So at the films, you talked about how when you did consult, it was on set or when you visited Stan Winston studio to see the animatronics that were being built. Can you think of any specifics about how your insight helped to direct some of the story or the design of the animals? Well, I, you know, I, anytime I'd go work with, with Stan and his crew, I mean, they were very good artists and, you know, I would, I would point out little, little, you know, details for them, but, you know, they, they were very good at it. As were the ILM you know, the ILM crew was really good as well. And and I sat down with a few of them and would point to, you know, point out things like how they walk and, and so on. We did that on set as well, when we had to make the big giant, you know, puppet, the T-Rex puppet, look like it was walking. It, it needed to put its feet down properly. So, you know, I, I helped them with that. And I don't know, you know, always was working on the script. They're, you know, they always had some weird things in there. Speaking of the scripts though, uh, one of the notes I had was a discussion from an earlier revision of the ending to The Lost World. You told a story of pelicans and coyotes as a possible analog to the velociraptors and pterosaurs in the workers' village. I did, I did a research project on, on the nesting ground of, of, uh, of pelicans. And I, I was just, I was always curious about, about, you know, they nest on islands in these very shallow lakes. And, and I was always curious as to, you know, why it was that coyotes or some, you know, some kind of predator didn't just walk out and eat, eat the birds. And I thought, you know, so I put on some wading boots and started wading out to the, to the, island where the pelicans were and it was about halfway across before i discovered why the why the coyotes don't go there <laughs> oh. <laughs> the coyotes, said... are, coyotes are a lot smarter than i am oh. i was being attacked by pelicans and uh. i can tell you they're big they've got sharp claws and and they got really bad fish breath uh. <laughs> <laughs> and you said apparently they didn't stop till you got to your car I, 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 they, they were relentless. Oh. <laughs> well, I'm sure a coyote learned that lesson at some point. <laughs> We've seen some of the artwork from Stan Winston's studio about the Parasaurolophus and its representation in the film. 
Some of the original crash art showed it with a full crest, but there were revisions and notes where you mentioned that if it were female, the crest should be less pronounced. Uh, even the mural art in the visitor center shows off a family unit with different crest sizes. Do you recall that conversation or what led them to simply using the full crest? Yeah, that, yeah, I think a lot of questions like that, but again, you know, we, we don't really know. We just don't have enough Paris or all of us to, you know, to get even a sense. We don't have, we don't have any idea about dimorphism in dinosaurs. We have maybe three identified three or four dinosaurs that are female based on medullary bone, which is the, the calcium buildup in the, in the leg bone before they laid eggs. But other than that, or, or a specimen that had eggs, eggs in it, um, um, other than that, you know, we just, we don't, we don't have any way of telling if we have a male or a female. We, I suspect they're more like birds than anything, and that it was just coloration differences between the males and the females. Like a peacock, where you got the bright colors versus something more muted. Yep. Exactly. Um, especially if uh, the female is going to be the one lying on a nest, you want that more muted, hidden colors. That exactly. would make sense. Uh, yep. Do you think that that factored into Spielberg's decision to make the dinosaurs a bit more muted in color? No. No? Okay. <laughs> no. They were muted in color because he wanted them scary looking. <laughs> fair, <laughs> fair. Just end of sentence. Scary. More tea. He said, I said, you know, they, they, we really should have these things colorful. And he said, he said, technicolor dinosaurs, he said, feathered technicolor dinosaurs are not scary enough. <laughs> I, I know in the Lost World, they try to show off a gender dimorphism with the dinosaurs, with crash art showing both male and female animals. Rex is, of course, being a male and female pair, and some of the art for JP3 even had male and female pterosaurs. There had been some discussions about having the baby Rex with feathers, like in the book, but that it wasn't something they were able to accomplish practically. It was, it was, it was, you know, it must, a lot of this stuff was just, tech, you know, technicality problem. Just, you know, we just didn't have the, didn't have the technology. Yeah, so they did what worked, what hit the audience in the best way, what was scariest, and what was most interesting. Awesome. Yeah. Speaking of The Lost World, um, during production, that script's ending changed several times. Um, and there was a behind the scenes video of you speaking with Stan Winston, Steven Spielberg, and a few others about the design of the Pteranodon long There are no Pteranodons this big, but Quetzalcoatlus is that. And there seemed to be some conflation in the production between that and Geosternbergia. Um, you pointed out that the model was pretty much exactly that of Quetzalcoatlus, if they just simply changed the head out, though. I, I, I don't remember that, but I mean, you know, we, we had a lot of conversations about all sorts of things. I, I remember little bits and pieces dealing with the pterosaur, but, but I mean, we just, you know, I tried to, you know, if there was anything that, that you know, seemed off out of place, I tried to fix it. and. And, you know, there was just no way of knowing what, what would stick, right? I mean, I mean, as a good example, you know, when we were out in the field in Jurassic Park and, you know, I, I brought a cast of, of a Deinonychus, you know, to put, to put in the ground so that they would have, you know, a realistic um, skeleton to be excavating. And, and, and Stephen, you know, looked at it and he says, okay, Jack, you, is this what you want? And I said, yep. And I, I said, you know, this is great. He says, all right, perfect. Well, he signed off on it. That's great. And then, you know, as soon as I was gone, he got rid of it and made it bigger. Made a, made a styrofoam one bigger. So you know, there, there was, there's never in that whole process, there was never really any way to know, you know, what you were gonna, what you say is whether it was gonna be, you know, it was gonna carry through the movie. In regards to dig sites, both Jurassic Park and Jurassic Park 3 show active digs in the films. How accurate would you say those representations were to an actual dig? Well, first off, the, the, the site, the Jurassic, you know, the Jurassic Park first, the first one, Jurassic Park 1, the the camp site is was taken from our site, our my very own, you know, 
I mean, it was taken. They tried to, they tried to, you know, duplicate it. Yeah. Wow. But, but what is funny is that they were on, they were, they were in a preserve and they couldn't stick anything in the ground. Oh. And so they had teepees out there like we had in our camp. But when the helicopter landed, blew them away. <laughs> <laughs> very dramatic shots, I'm sure. Uh, that's I could so, I could see so that the, being very dramatic. So you know the trailer they were in. I mean, all of it was you know. I mean, if if you were to look at everything carefully, they had our kind of beer. They had I mean, just, <laughs> they had a lot of detail there. Yeah. Uh, and the uh, same goes for you know the the dig site at at. Uh, in Jurassic Park 3, mm. uh, jo Joe Johnston actually came into the field with us. <laughs> and, and in fact, he comes out almost every summer now. Wow. And so, and so you know, he, he, he did his best to get as much detail, accurate detail in on the dig site as well. So that, that was fun. And the truck that Alan drives in Jurassic Park 3 has been rumored to be your truck? It, it, it's, it wasn't mine, but okay. it's a spitting image of mine. Oh. <laughs> same color, I mean, same year. I, it, I, I was impressed that he was yeah. able to find one. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's that's some attention to detail, which I suppose, though, makes sense. I mean, Joe Johnson is known for his artistic eye, his drawings and designs. He's worked on Star Wars, the original trilogy, Raiders of Lost Ark, even the original Battlestar Galactica. I can imagine having him out there would be like an invaluable asset though. He'd be able to sketch all the digs. Well, he wasn't, he didn't come draw anything. He was, he was he set on finding a T-Rex. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'll find one. I know you've been able to find a few. So with your combined luck, I'm sure he will. I'm not sure if it's something a lot of people noticed in Jurassic Park and I might ruin it for some people, but you can kind of tell when they cut from the first unit on location work to the second unit reshoots because what they did on location was very delicate but anything on the second unit they're just going at it digging it out like i said i <laughs> I, I signed off on one version and yeah it, it, who knows what they used <laughs> <laughs> that's fair jurassic park is of course about bringing dinosaurs back finding amber with mosquitoes and possibly preserving prehistoric blood but we've since learned that the study Crichton references actually had its results contaminated, so no DNA was ever found in the amber. What do you think of our ability to bring animals back and the narrative stance on if we should? Well, I'm, I'm fine with it. The, we still have the Dino Chicken Project. We're right. We still have, you know, there are still researchers working on it, and and we've made a lot of progress. I mean, we, you know, but we've discovered that some of the characteristics that would you know, it would be cool to bring back like the long tail uh, are not atavistic genes. They're not ancestral genes. So they're not there to turn back on again. So I, I was hoping they would be because, I mean, they are in us. I mean, we, you know, uh, the every once in a while, children are born with a few extra vertebrae. So, so that gene or that genetic pathway exists in humans I, I, at, before a month ago, I was very surprised that it wasn't in, in birds as well. But a month ago or so, we, we actually learned some very interesting things about that evolutionary sequence from, hmm. from dinosaurs to birds. And, and I can't tell you about it because <laughs> we have a scientific paper that we're trying to get submitted to, to a fancy journal. So. Awesome. Well, we will definitely keep an eye out for that. That sounds really exciting because I've seen that with the bringing back the teeth and like you said, attempting right. with the tail. Yeah, there, there are a lot of atavistic genes. I mean, birds have a number of them and, and, and a few laboratories around have actually, you know, figured out ways that they could be brought, you know, these that we could get some of these back into a bird. And so, so, you know, that, that, that's interesting. And, and, the coolest thing of all, though, is, you know, I mean, I obviously I'd like to love to have a baby, you know, a, a, a pet dinosaur, right? Well, one that wasn't going to get too big. We don't want to <laughs> pet Triceratops because it's bigger than my house. <laughs> but, uh, but the whole, you know, the whole 
research project in looking at these kinds of things is spinning off some really incredible science that that a lot of it is applicable to you know modern medicine and and a lot to just you know ev understanding the evolutionary sequence uh, between dinosaurs and birds so you know we're learning an awful lot of stuff and it's stuff that we wouldn't have learned otherwise i mean you know you it takes it, it takes a crazy idea first right yeah you know and the idea of trying to bring back a dinosaur is a crazy idea by anybody's you know evaluation of it but like I say, the, the really cool thing about it is all of what we're learning um, having to do with so many other branches of science. In Jurassic World's ancillary materials, they actually discuss how they were reaching a 99% purity. In dozens of species. And how you could then see the lineage of all the dinosaurs. So by looking back, you can see how those steps diverge and where something starts or where another one continued. And with modern medicine, there are many genetic conditions where the gene either isn't activated or another one is, which causes changes in growth, lack of production of something needed for life. So by doing this, you could learn how to heal or to prevent certain genetic conditions. It's actually a very bold idea from what seems like a very simple concept. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, one day we, we will be able to make whatever we want to make. I mean, once we have a better understanding of the genes and, and the pathways that, you know, we, we will be able to do this stuff. I mean, we're, you know, we're already doing lots of genetic engineering. It's not like it's, you know, it's a brand new field or anything. I mean, you know, we, we've got all kinds of, all, virtually everything in our lives is, is some kind of GMO. Right. <laughs> yeah, that is very true. It's, it's in a lot of different things, between foods, between medications. Yeah, it's definitely uh, everywhere. All of our pets, right? <laughs> That's true as well. Yes, the selective breeding, exactly, or farm animals, exactly. So Crichton tends to be very cautionary with his science and morality tales, highlighting man's hubris, for example. But the truth of it is, of course, that there is an avenue to do this responsibly or safely. Do you feel that's where we're moving towards, or is it more of, as they say in the films, this is how you play God? Well, I, you know, well, for, you know, I, my response to the playing God thing is always the same. There is no God, you can't play God. If there is a God, he gave us all these tools, so why not use them? Love it. I right? love it. I mean, mm -hmm. you know. Don't want us making animals, don't, don't give us the tools. <laughs> right. No, that's very fair. It just doesn't make any sense, you know, so, so, but, you know, when it comes down to, you know, right, right and wrong, scientists, you know, scientists don't have any business trying to figure that out anyway, really. I mean, that's, scientists should, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we should figure out everything we can do, right? I don't mean we're going to do it, but but you know it, there's there's not very many instances you can think of where a person should well we know how to do that but we shouldn't do it, um, or we think we know how we might do it but we shouldn't do it because of whatever. I mean, you know, I the, the thing is it's just like you know it's like an atom bomb, right? I mean, no, we shouldn't use them, but on the other hand, we should or should. Uh, we should at least know how to make one in case somebody else decides to make one, right? And by learning that, we've learned the concepts that lay the foundation for space travel or energy production or for further steps like fission or nuclear medicine. Exactly, all, all sorts of things. But the, the point is, is that, you know, science, you know, we should at least push to understand as much as possible. That's actually a really great segue because I'd like to discuss your approach to paleontology. In the past, you have seemingly been a voice for a lot of questions that might be considered radical or even simply radical for posing the question or saying, what can we learn about this? 
a few notable conversations you've been a part of are the T-Rex and its predatory patterns, or even the TED Talk where you discuss the growth patterns in species like the Triceratops and Taurosaurus, or Pachycephalosaurus and Draco Rex and Stiggy Moloch. Are there any particular theories that you feel passionate about, or do you feel that these are more questions that you're asking because a scientist should be asking these questions? Well, you know, I mean, I, you know, science is supposed to be objective, so you know, you're not supposed to have your pet, you know. Scientists shouldn't have a, you know, their pet ideas of what how things are, and then go out and look for evidence to support them. You know, science True. is the opposite of that, right? We we propose a hypothesis and then we try to falsify it. And so, you know, the the idea of you know, T Rex and how it feeds, you know, I get hate mail for, you know, I mean, I get I get people who send nasty letters to me, you know. And, and 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 some of them are little kids, <laughs> Just, huh. you know. Huh. <laughs> they're they're very passionate about their T Rex being an apex predator, and and I try to teach, I try to use it to teach people that you know that's not being objective. You can't just look for all the evidence to support your your hypothesis. You need to try to actually falsify it. Try to. And, and so this, you know, I try to do this with kids, you know, so they understand how science works, but it's, you know, it's even hard to get the, a scientist, you know, that to do the same thing because most, you know, most scientists don't like the idea of T-Rex, you know, being a scavenger either. And I, and I say, you know, let's just look at, let's be objective and look at all the evidence and, and, and just see, you know, what, what, what are the opportunities of, for a T-Rex? I mean, you know, you compare the skeleton of a T-Rex to a Velociraptor and they look night and day different, right? I mean, so those animals are doing something that are night and day different. And, and to say they're doing exactly the same thing is just ludicrous. I mean, it's, you know, they're, so, you know, I, like I say, I, I try to use these kinds of arguments just to under, so people understand how we do the scientific method with the simplicity of science. But boy, I'll tell you, when people have, you know, have set their mind on what they want a particular animal to do for a living, they're, they're not, they're not really, you know, ripe for, for objectivity. <laughs> right. Well, even with the pelican story, you're drawing a, a direct analog between a pterosaur and a pelican and the raptor and the coyote. Do you find that that helps drawing modern comparisons to look at the biomes and ecological niches and how the animals would act in them? Yeah, no, I, you know, it's like, so, you know, for years, I, I didn't really publish a paper about T-Rex. And finally, when we did our big Hell Creek project where we could, you know, where we were finding incredible amounts of stuff, you know, we just based on, on, on population, you know, quote, populations of, of things, what we were finding most of, uh, suggested that T-Rex was probably an opportunist, right? And an opportunist is like a hyena, right? I mean, a hyena is an opportunist. It, it can, you know, it's not going to chase down gazelles like a cheetah. It's going to take whatever is easiest to get, and and if it's dead, it's dead. It'll eat that too. So, I mean, that that's basically what a T Rex is. Is a, is a big hyena, and and there's lots of them in the Serengeti, and there's lots of T Rexes in its ecosystem. So, you know, that makes sense. So, but again, you know, you you start talking about that to the general public or even to scientists, and they're like, well. There's the, you know, but think about this and but think about that, but think, you know, rather than trying to falsify that hypothesis, they're just looking for something to support their own. And, and again, that's just, that's not how we do science. You know, that's just not the right way to do it. So you're right. I mean, science is intended to be impartial. Here's my hypothesis. What proves it? What disproves it? And what does the evidence tell me? How do I improve my hypothesis to better fit what we're seeing? And I think as people that can be very hard because we all have a tendency to say, this is my hypothesis and here are the things that support it. Exactly. 
That's right. Yep, that's unfortunate. But and that's sort of the you know that's the Draco Rex problem. That's the you know the Triceratops problem. People you know they don't you know the idea that Torosaurus is a adult Triceratops is just mind boggling to most people. And they keep saying oh, it's got holes in its furrow. It's got holes in its frill. You know, and you know, quite frankly, that's the only difference between them, right? Except Torosaurus is a lot bigger than a Triceratops, and so you know, a lot bigger just tells me that you know it kept growing. <laughs> and I know <laughs> one of the issues you spoke to in your TED talk was that in order to approve a lot of these, you have to have access to the specimens to be able to do a core drill of the bone to see the growth pattern. And if you don't have the specimen or there's not that many, you'd have to get permission to including from people who may not have a lot of buy-off on your hypothesis and may not wish to do that to the specimen. Well, I, I don't, I don't, I didn't because, you know, I, I'd collect dinosaurs myself, so I didn't have to go ask about somebody else's. But, but yeah, I mean, that was how I tried to falsify the hypothesis, right? We, we propose the hypothesis, then we look at bone histology to attempt to disprove it, and it didn't disprove it. It support so so you know there again that's that you know you start accumulating evidence like that and and if somebody's going to hype you know go in and falsify it they need to accumulate their own information not just argue with it our three-part interview with jack horner continues next week where we discuss behind the scenes stories from the films paleontology and exciting updates on Jack's current work. Until then, we invite everyone to celebrate National Dinosaur Day by checking out Jack Horner's Dinosaurs website, where you can see a collection of the NFT paleo art Jack was discussing. We're also excited to help announce that Jack Horner's Dinosaurs Neotony NFT collection will drop on June 1st. Like the Origin collection before it, these art pieces will benefit research and education. Links are in the description. Thanks to everyone who made this interview possible, and we'll see you all next week here at Jurassic Time.